Okay. So it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you, and I want to thank uh, Professor Dalizola for um, the invitation of being here today in such a great place full of history for, in fact, this uh, Levi Civita lecture. It's a great honor to be to be here. Uh, today I will make my lecture uh, on continuum mechanics and on uh, the topic that will be how group theory and group representation theory can help us to better understand the mechanical contents of the measure, strain, stress measure we handle. So I will begin with a brief a description of classical elasticity and then move to uh, generalized elasticity to explain what is the difference and why we need some uh, more sophisticated tool to properly understand what is um, what is the physics. So this talk will be very, uh, I, I don't know what was the audience, so I make it as pedagogical as I can, so maybe for some person, for some mathematician, that will be very basic. But I will try to make um, a message to to, to the, communi the mechanical community how mathematical tools can help us in everyday uh, work. So very quickly, if I consider continuum mechanics and much more precisely classical elasticity in its linear framework, at the beginning I got some degrees of freedom. My degrees of freedom will be here uh, only a displacement field. And with this degree of freedom I will create uh, primary state variables. By duality I will obtain a stress tensor that will be the Cauchy stress tensor and my primary state variable will give me a strain measure that will inform me how my, the matter is distorted. If I'm in uh, classical linear elasticity, these two quantities that are second of the tensor are connected by a force of the tensor that is known to be the Hooke's tensor. So for my notation, the tilde will indicate a second order tensor, and hence double tilde will indicate a fourth order tensor. As I use a symmetry, I put in parentheses index that can be permutated, so it's symmetric between the permutation of E and G. And the block that are underlined can be also switched. So this notation indicates the symmetries of index symmetries of my object. That was for the constitutive law. Now for the physical structure, the physical law of elasticity, I love to use this diagram which was introduced by uh, a famous for me Italian uh, scientist which called Enno Tonti, in which he put on the first branch how the primal quantities that their nature are kinematic. In the house branch, you will have the dual quantities. And between those, these two branches, you will have the constitutive law. So this diagram sum up most of the more important question of linear elasticity. But classical elasticity so suffers from a drawback. This theory cannot take into account in the continuum fashion internal lengths. So if I want to describe a microstructural effect in a continuum way, I cannot use uh, in its current formulation uh, classical uh, mechanics, continuum mechanics. So I wish to extend my uh, theory. There is at least two possibilities to do that. 
The first one is to keep all the same degrees of freedom, but to take into the mechanical formulation higher grading of the displacement field into account. This way of thinking is called one of, a famous example is Medlin strain gradient elasticity. The kinematical descriptor of the strain and the gradient of strain. There is another approach, which I call I grade continua, in which I stay with the first order theory, but I will enlarge my set of degrees of freedom. The most basic example is to consider at a point uh, not only the displacement field, but a rotation of the matter. Doing that, I will obtain the Coursera uh, theory. But I can also extend my kinematic, taking count in a point, the displacement field and a complete uh, second order tensor. That will be the Ehringen micromorphic medium. So my talk today will be focused on strain gradient elasticity, but all the tools I will discuss can be uh, straightfully applied to other kind of situation. But I will take an example from the beginning to the end, and this example will be taken from strain gradient elasticity. So here, what I'm doing when I speak about strain gradient elasticity, as I told you, my set of degree of freedom remain the same, but I will add another primary state variable, which will be the second gradient of the displacement field. Assuming that hypothesis, how will obtain the classical stress measure completed by an higher order stress measure, that will be the gradient of the strain and which is described by a third order tensor, symmetric and the permutation of its two first index. So by duality, the classical Cauchy stress tensor will be completed by a higher measure of stress called the hyperstress tensor that have the same index symmetries. In the case of a linear framework, my constitutive law will become more complex since I will need, aside from the classical Hux tensor, two other higher order tensor, one which is five, fifth order and one which is sixth order. So the mechanical description become more complex. But I will focus myself much more specifically on the higher order um, strain measure, that is my third order tensor, uh, under with uh, first two index symmetries. That is a common point for all higher order uh, mechanical system to involve in the description higher order tensor. But if anyone in mechanics will understand what is the information contained into a second order symmetric tensor, the mechanical content of higher order measure seems to be, uh, at the day, a bit fuzzy. So we will use tools from group, theorem, group representation theory to try to get a, a, a sense, a meaning to, to that. And since the operation we're going to make uh, depend, may depend on the space dimension, my talk will be focused specifically on the three-dimensional space. So getting back on my problem, I got a strain gradient tensor. OK. I want to break it into smaller pieces having a mechanical meaning. So the first reflex is to go and to read the literature to find uh, an answer that uh, uh, seems to be sound. But the situation is fuzzy. There is a lot of author, 
as an, there is a lot of definition. So you can find different decomposition. At least if the decomposition is not unix, that's not a problem. But the number of elementary pieces vary from one author to another. So that situation is not satisfactory. So we're going to look for a correct definition of elementary decomposition and try to give a word to what elementary mean. So we're going to proceed. I'm looking back to the case of a second order tensor and properly understand the operation and next generalize this operation to higher order. And at these steps, tools from representation uh, will be of great help. So let's get back to second order tensors. If I give to a mechanician a second order tensor and I ask him to decompose it, intuitively, what you're going to make, you will take the, the tensor, take the symmetric part, take the anti-symmetric part, that will be the first step, and once this step is achieved, it will take the trace, remove the trace for the symmetric part, and say, okay, I complete the decomposition. So in fact, what you obtain at the end is uh, the composition that is invariant under the group of isometries of space. But the things is not formulated in that way. And the notion of group seems to be always missed in the, the, this way of proceeding. So more specifically, I take my tensor, take apart the symmetric component, and let in other side the anti-symmetric component. So I obtain one piece with it, which is six-dimensional, and a remainder, which is three-dimensional. That's the first step. But it can be observed that these two tensors are covariant with the initial tensor under the action of the linear invertible transformation. That means that if I took a tensor, transform it, and then decompose it, or if I took the tensor, make the decomposition, then the transformation, I will obtain the same object at the end. In mathematical language, that would say that this diagram is a commutative, is a commutative diagram. The action commutes. The commutation is for the general linear group. That seems important. So, okay. The step one is achieved. Now let's go to step two. So at step two, I take my uh, second of the symmetric tensor and I took its trace away. What I obtain at the end? Here it will be a second of the symmetric trustless tensor and at the other end I will obtain here what is called the spherical part that is basically defined only by a scalar. But every time I see an anti-symmetric tensor, I need to contract it with the Levi-Civita tensor in order to reduce its order and obtain at the end a vector, or more specifically, a pseudo-vector. So at the end of the decomposition, what I obtain? I got at the beginning a second order tensor, and at the end, I obtain a collection of a second order symmetric trustless tensor, a pseudo vector, and a scalar. So, an isomorphism between that object and uh, the space of that object and the space in which this object lives in. And this isomorphism is not noted here by phi. So, this decomposition is also covariant with T, but under another group action that will be O3, that is the group of isometry of space, that is the rotation and the inversion. And once again, my, as uh, my tensor are covariant, this diagram is a commutative one. 
Hence, what, what I construct is an isomorphism between the space of second order tensor and the direct sum of the space of third order, uh, second order sy symmetric trustless vector, in fact, third order vector, and scalar. That's the classical decomposition. So here, I just sum up uh, what I, I tell you. What is interesting, it's at each step, there is a mechanical content on that operation. The symmetric parts refer to the strain. The anti-symmetric part refer to the spin of the matter. And in the mechanical formulation, spin does not interest us, so we throw this part away. At the second level, the trustless second order part will encode for the shears, while the spherical part will encode for the volume change. So we got an interpretation of the decomposition. So we're going to try to make the same for a third of the tensor. So let's proceed to the first step. And as I represent here, uh, Tetris, this famous uh, popular game, will be the key to obtain the irreducible decomposition of my third order tensor. So here I will introduce some um, definition very quickly because I need it. That's not the main point, but uh, I need to speak about that. In group re representation theory, there is a very powerful theorem that's called the shoe veil duality that told you that the irreducible representation under the GL action is more or less the same as the irreducible representation under the symmetric group SN action on the tensor space. And here I explicitly write what is the action of the symmetric group on that uh, tensor space. So, the symmetry group act by permutation of the index. And another important result is that irreducible representation of the symmetry group are indexed by the conjugacy classes of the symmetry group. And we know that these symmetry classes are labeled by a partition of the integer n. So, the partition is the different way of writing an integer as a sum of other integer. So, as usual, after definition, the best thing is to give an example. So I will took the symmetric group X3, so the group of permutation acting on three elements. This group is very interesting for understanding the mechanical content of our tensor. And in fact, there is three way uh, there is six permutations in that group, and they are of three different types. So they belong to three different uh, conjugacy classes. The first action is no action. To each element, I've made a one cycle. I put the element to itself. So we can say here I got three one cycle. The second way is just to interchange to index and let the other and change. So it's one, one cycle, identity, and one, two cycle. And the other transformation is to switch its index. So I got one, three cycles. So this is the three conjugacy classes. And here it's the partition of the number three. Three will be a three cycle, so it will indicate this conjugacy classes. Here I got a two cycle and a one cycle, so this will indicate this kind of transformation. And here will indicate that there is no, no uh, transformation. Oh, that's why it's uh, written here. So here I get back to Tetris, which is very well known in mathematics as soon as somebody speaks about. Uh, the symmetric group and its representation, the natural reflex is to think about a Jung diagram. So Jung diagram is just a way to represent in a in diagram um, a conjugacy classes. So here three, 
Okay, I got three boxes in a row. For the um, conjugacy to one, I got two cycles here in a row and the one cycle just down. And here for the three one cycle, I put box in a column. So that's the definitions. The other one will be if I put label uh, number ranging from 1 to n into a diagram, I will obtain a Young tableau. This is needed for the last and most important definition that will be of the greatest use just after. I will introduce the notion of a standard Young tableau, that is, uh, only a Young tableau in which the sequence of number increase in row and increase in column. The example is given here. I got an increasing sequence here, here increasing sequence, increasing sequence, etc. That is, this four diagram, the only four your standard your table you can find. And the reason of this interest is the following. In fact, Jung standard Jung tableau will indicate to you the different representation of your uh, symmetric group action on tensor and hence, due to shoe veil duality, the irre irreducible representation of the general linear group on your tensor. So what appear clearly here? It is that for fertile tensor, I got three standard tableau, so my representation will block into four elementary pieces under the action of the linear group. That is exactly what we obtained for second order tensor space. We got in that case only two standard tableau, the first one in column and the other one in a row. The one in column just indicated that your representation is totally anti-symmetric. The one in a row just indicated that your representation is completely symmetric. So you find the anti-symmetric part and the symmetric part. Here, for thermal tensor, you will obtain a completely anti-symmetrical part, a completely symmetric part, and two parts with kind of mixed symmetry. This mixed symmetry, I will spoil a bit my presentation, are the Bianchi identities that exist on several objects in uh, remaining geometry. But more specifically, for the space I'm interested in, this representation does not exist. The space of strain gradient tensor will just split into two irreducible, geo irreducible space. So it will be rather technical, but if I know the, the tableau, I can compute explicitly the projector that will take my generic tensor and project it on the right irreducible space. That's called the Young symmetrizer. Very quickly, I defined the operations that preserve each row. I defined the operations that preserve each column. And I will make, I will create an operator that will be the product of the first by the second, taking account the signature of the transformation. As usual, the best thing is to look at an example. So here, I took my tableau. Here, the operation that will let the row invariant are this one. And for the column, that is this set of operations. If I make the product, I will obtain this sequence of operation. The sequence of operation acting on the generic parallel tensor space gives me the explicit symmetrization of my operator. So at the end, I can tell you that this space is the space of thermal tensor that is anti-symmetric between the permutation of the first and last index, and which also satisfies this identity, which is Bianchi identity. So I can apply this to my third of the tensor. Here I took the space of tensor with no symmetry 
if you are doing some micromorphic modeling of the matter, that will be the tensor to consider, and hence the decomposition to consider. There is some tools that can allow you to quickly compute the dimension. The first representation is 10 dimensional, the second one 8, the third one is the same, so 8, and the last one is unidimensional. The last one is just the determinant. So if you make the sum, you obtain at the end the 27 dimension of your original space. And here is the proper decomposition, if the GL invariant decomposition of the space of strain gradient tensor. So just two parts. One is 10 dimensional and the other one is eight dimensional. And this is really, really important because this decomposition into two mechanism that are preserved under any linear transformation was also found by mechanical filling of Midlins, one of the most important mechanicians in that field. In his, one of his famous paper in 1968 with Eschel, it, it tells that say, there is at least three ways of writing the equation of uh, strain gradient elasticity. And in the third formulation, he said, okay, well, let's split the tensor to complete symmetric part because that's, that is the stretch gradient. So it creates a stretch gradient effect encoded by the complete symmetric part of the tensor. And he said, okay, and aside I will create an eight dimensional part that encode for the rotation gradient effect. So what I obtained by group theory was obtained by my mechanical analysis by, uh, by Midlin. So what is important, I, I will make the remark in the uh, opposite direction, is that in a, for, for me, in a physical model, the ingredients you put in your, um, your modeling are uh, a irreducible representation of the linear group. If I choose to consider just one representation, I will say R and not S, what I will obtain I will obtain the coupled stress model. If I just took the other representation, I will obtain the stretch, stretch gradient model. And if I took the two representation, I'll obtain the complete strain gradient answer. So elementary mechanisms are correspond to different representation of the linear group. So that's an excerpt from the paper of Midlin. Another point is you can find a direct, you can rephrase the Tansy diagram of uh, elasticity uh, in terms of uh, GL ir irreducible representation. U is a vector, okay, one box is a vector. The strain is totally symmetric, second order. Okay, you got the strain. Here, you got the incompatibility tensor, which is a fourth order tensor. Its representation is the square. And you can uh, keep on uh, working like that. So I can rephrase my fancy diagram in terms of irreducible representation. And what is important is that, in fact, this incompatible tensor, which has this shape, is no more than the, uh, the curvature tensor of Riemannian geometry. And I know that if this tensor is zero, my second tensor field can be integrated into a displacement field. So knowing this box and the way to compute uh, the symmetrizer, I can obtain in a one line the Saint-Venant condition of the classical elasticity. I obtain straightfully my compatibility condition. And I can extend it to higher order. If I consider a third order symmetric tensor and ask myself under which condition the third order symmetric tensor derive from a field of second order symmetric tensor, I will just have to kill this tensor that is encoded by an higher order curvature tensor. Proceeding in that way, I straightfully obtain my, uh, my integrability condition. 
So that's a very powerful tool to condense the mechanical equation. So here it's kind of diagrammatic uh, uh, sum up of what I told. GL representation will concern the primal branch and the dual branch of your physical law, but will not concern directly the constitutive law. This branch may be one way to say that will be the, the gauche group of the, this branch and this branch are the general uh, linear, uh, the general um, linear group. But what we are interested in will be also the constitutive law. So that's the next step of the decomposition. Uh, so here I will talk about isometric invariant decomposition. In literature, that is the same as harmonic decomposition, as you can find in Fortin Vianello uh, paper. And it's also the same as the spherical harmonics that, could, that you can find in uh, quantum mechanics for the structure of the hydrogen atom. So for me, common tensor are the kind of elementary gears of complex mechanism. And so to understand the mechanism, you have to know the number and the type of your elementary gears and the way that your elementary gears are connected. So the first one is kind of classification modulo any kind of isomorphism. Here, the schematic of the mechanism will be the isomorphism. But the point is, most of the property can be uh, deduced not knowing the way the, your pieces are connected. You can make a lot of things just knowing the number of your elementary pieces and the type. So, elementary pieces will belong to what I call harmonic tensor space. This space will be not HK and contain tensor of K order, completely symmetric and trustless. So if you take for K2, you will obtain the definition of a deviator. A deviator is a second order trustless symmetric tensor. The dimension of HK is 2K plus 1. So once again, you take 2. 5 is the dimension of a deviator. Take 1, you obtain a vector. And take 0, you obtain a scalar. The action is the classical action. I said that you can do a lot of things uh, if you don't know how your um, different elements are uh, arranged into your big tensor. The reason is you can uh, compute additively by product, in fact, uh, the product of two representation using something which is very well known in uh, quantum mechanics, which is the Clapsch Gordon rule. The thing is very simple. I took two representation. If you took for P and Q one, you get the vector product, the tensor product of two vector. The representation will split into elementary representation, ranging from P minus Q to P plus Q. So let's take let's take two tens, two vector. So H one H one. I make the product, and it will split from representation of order zero, I obtain a scalar. One, I obtain a vector. And two, I obtain a deviator. So with this uh, very simple formula, I can obtain what is contained in the second order tensor. And you can iterate the process to find what is contained in the third tensor, fourth order tensor, and, and so on, just applying this rule in, 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 uh, in an iterate way. So that allows me to make an X-ray analysis of the structure of my third order tensor. That is the example, the red, uh, the red line since the beginning of the presentation. So my third order tensor space that I am interested in, I applied my rule. I may add the vector, the derivation, on the structure of the tensor symmetric and I obtain at the end this structure. That is, my uh, strand gradient tensor decomposed into 
an higher order deviator, which is five dimensional, one pseudo deviator, which is five, uh, five dimensional, and two vector uh, parts. That is strictly the deviatoric decomposition of your pseudo tensor. <coughs> so the, the right extension of what is commonly due in a uh, post-second tensor. But as soon as you get decomposition, the first question to ask is, is your decomposition canonical or not? The answer is, as soon as in your decomposition, you have two space of the same order, it is uh, two scalar parts or two vector parts, the decomposition is no more unique. So you got a plenty of way to decompose your, your tensor in elementary parts. The best example that uh, every mechanician know is the case of the elasticity tensor. Its space can be decomposed into a nine-dimensional uh, deviator, two classical deviator, and two scalar. Due to the fact that you got two scalar, the decomposition is not unique. That results in the fact that you got a wide possibility to choose your isotropic moduli, either Lamy parameter or uh, the Young modulus and the Poisson ratio. This is due to the non-unicity of the harmonic decomposition of your uh, vector space. So that's interesting, this, non, this uh, absence of unicity. So uh, here, I can propose, I will propose two mechanisms for that decomposition. Uh, all these two mechanisms I will propose are uniquely defined because of the choice of a middle operation. The first will be, okay, I took my third tensor, I get on the way its complete symmetric part, and on the other side it's a reminder. And after I make the harmonic decomposition of each part. In this way, I will obtain this component that is uniquely defined because it is alone at the at third order. This one is alone at a second order. No. So this one are unique. But I got interpretation of my vector part. Here, it will be a vector part which will belong to the uh, stretch, uh, stretch gradient. And here, I will have a vector part that belongs to the uh, rotational gradient. Because for uh, remembering, here it's the rotational part, gradient rotation here, here is the gradient of stretch. But another way to proceed is to say, bah, at the end, what is uh, the strain gradient? is the gradient of my, my, my quantity called strain. And my quantity called strain, I can took is the deviatoric part, so the shear, and I can took is uh, dilatational part, the spherical one. And I can, after, make the harmonic decomposition. So here, it's the same uh, component as before, because there is no ambiguity on that component, but here, I obtain two new quantities, two new vector parts, one which is associated with the gradient of shear, in fact, and the other which is associated to the gradient of dilatation. That is interesting because crossing this to the to this to decomposition give sense to all the elementary part of my decomposition. H3 is seven dimensional, it is a part of the stretch gradient, and it generates, it is a part of the shear gradient, so you see the mechanism, and as a, kin as a kinematic, it will generate you some uh, stretch gradient deformation. On the other end, H2, so space of deviator, uh, is generated by the gradient of shears and will produce. Uh, a, a gradient of rotation. For the vector part, all depend of the interpretation you choose. So, as I told you before, this decomposition is really important for the study of constitutive law. I will not get 
into detail, but I will say a few words on that point. If you consider a linear framework, your constitutive law will be uh, encoded by uh, a huge tensor. The structure of this uh, constitutive tensor is completely determined by the harmonic structure of your state tensor. If you give me your state tensor, I can tell you the number of symmetric class of your behavior, the type of the symmetric class of your behavior, and the number of coefficients in each one of this class. So everything is just piloted, driven by this decomposition. In the same way, the spectral structure of your linear operator is completely determined by the harmonic decomposition of the state tensor. And if I wish to switch from linear framework to nonlinear, and if I wish to construct um, non, the most nonlinear nonlinear function, I will have to determine the integrity basis of my uh, of my uh, state tensor quantities, and the harmonic composition, the higher the deviator are the building block that will allow you to compute this, comp this integrity basis. But to compute an integrity basis with higher the tensor is, is a huge, huge problem at the present time. But the building block here is uh, clearly identified. So just an example on the symmetry classification. Since I know that I work just with strain, I know that the operator just can just be uh, just belong to the space of elasticity tensor that is de determined by my state tensor, and applying some theorem, I obtain the structure that elasticity is divided in eight symmetric class: uh, triclinic, monoclinic, autotropic, trigonal, tetragonal, transverse isotropic, cubic, and uh, isotropic. And for strain gradient elasticity, I can proceed in the same way. In fact, with a PhD student called uh, Marc Olive, uh, we obtain a general theorem to have the symmetry classes for any kind of uh, tensor in three dimension, be there uh, even order or other the tensor. And we use that elementary decomposition as the building block of our demonstration. So to sum up, I will say that the isometric decomposition or harmonic decomposition is mostly concerned by the transversal path of my diagram. And as conclusion, I think it's important to uh, melt, to intricate this to the composition. Since when you choose a proper decomposition for here, your state variable, okay, you have the same for the geology, you will structure your physical law, here for me it's the physical law, and you will give the structure of uh, a nice structure on your constitutive law. So to sum up, a reducible group uh, for me is an important way to make some surgery on tensor and to return certain parts that have meaning and others that don't have any meaning. And it helps to understand uh, what is contained in your model. Postulate as a state tensor, uh, fee for the tensor, for the force of the tensor is meaningless. You have to understand what is contained in the box. The box is not the mechanism. The box contains elementary mechanism. So for me, what is important is that. So GL3 decomposition are the elementary mechanism you put in your model, while O3 decomposition is important for the formulation of constitutive law and um, understanding of what is contained within. The, with this discussion can be uh, considered with uh, also group of transformation uh, that might be interesting. I think for wave propagation, as you got a plane, uh, you got a plane. Another step may be to consider uh, how to decomposition. I mean, uh, the operations that preserve uh, a plane and so a front. So.
So there is a lot of application of this way of thinking uh, to higher, to other, I mean, um, higher continuum model to construct the integrity basis and uh, Maybe, I'm, I'm not sure, um, but I think it could be interesting to analyze the dynamics of a complex a model, micromorphic or second grade, uh, trying to use some um, group approach to understand what is the dynamical behavior of uh, extended continuum mechanics. So uh, that's the end of my talk and I thank you for uh, your attention. you decomposed the constitutive law that will be just for linear law. But if you change your mind and not focus on the law, but at uh, what is described by the law, what is the primal quantity, if you describe the primal quantity, you get rid away of the law and you can work in linear if you want or toward uh, non-linear if you want. That's why the most important thing are the primal quantity. <laughs>